Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Breaking Bad Season 5 Part 1. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review every episode of Breaking Bad one season at a time. In this video I will cover the first half of Season 5 of Breaking Bad. Now I know in my Season 4 review, if you have seen that, I stated that I would be covering all of Season 5 in one video and I would not be splitting it up, but I have since changed my mind. Now, my original reasoning was because Season 5 was actually aired in two halves. They aired the first eight episodes, uh, and then had a long break, and then they aired the second uh, eight episodes. And so, but in the past, whenever seasons have done this, I've decided to cover the whole season as a whole. Uh, the big ex example of that is BoJack Horseman Season 6, which also had aired in two halves, but I decided to cover all of that season in one video, and that was my same thinking, that this was all one season regardless of how they aired it, so I was going to cover it as one season. However, once it came down to it, I realized that I had so much to say about this season, and in fact, I also wanted to add it uh, the... Uh, movie El Camino to this season as well so I had so much to say about a 16 episode season and a two hour movie that if I tried to fit it all in one video it would end up being over three hours long now there has been past examples of me splitting up one season over two videos I did this with Babylon 5 season 4 and Star Trek Enterprise season 3 two both seasons were my favorite season of their respective shows. Uh, they're both seasons I really loved and I have a lot to say about, which, by the way, season five, my favorite season of Breaking Bad, and I have a lot to say about as well. So even though that was actually one season that was aired all at once for both those examples, Babylon 5 and Enterprise, I decided to split those videos up. Uh, split that season up into two videos just because it was so I had so much to say about it. the video ended up being over three hours and I realized in advance that would be the case here so I have decided to split it up um, into two videos however I will not be treating each part or each half of season five as separate seasons I will be treating it as a singular season, I'm just spreading it over two videos. So, in other words, what that means is this video, I will begin with my introduction, as I always do, where I'll talk about the season as a whole, and I will talk about the whole season, not just the first half. Uh, and then at the end of the video, I'm not going to have any conclusions. I'm actually going to save that for part two. So, I'll go into the first eight episodes of the season and then in the video and next video i'll go into the second eight episodes of the season and then get into my favorite or least favorite episodes of the entire season not just first or second half but the entire season and then i'll give my rating for the entire season as a whole in the second part so <laughs> now that the administrative stuff is out of the way let me talk about season five of breaking bad now i have stated in the past that this not only do i consider this the best season of breaking bad which i think it easily is i also consider it the best season of any tv show ever i had stated this several times in my channel i had done a, a top 10 favorite seasons of tv video where i choose my favorite season of my favorite shows and rank them in order and breaking bad season five was number one on that list so i considered it the best season of television ever watching it again i firmly stand by that stance now <laughs> when i stated that before and I actually got a little bit of pushback saying that they agree as far as the second half of season five goes that that was just pure gold and it was amazing episode after amazing episode but that the first half of season five wasn't all that great and kind of brings the season down as a whole so if you judge the season as a whole it's actually not the best season ever however watching the first half of breaking bad i say that i actually absolutely disagree now i will say 
that the first half is not as great as the second. I think the second half, I wouldn't be too surprised if I give every single episode in the second half a 10. <laughs> Whereas there was one episode this in the first half I gave a 6, and uh, I think a couple 8s, uh, a couple 9s, and a couple 10s. Um, whereas the second half, if not every episode of 10, maybe there'll be some nines, but I doubt that it'll probably all be nines and tens. Um, but that being said, the first half is still amazing. Like, I don't think it bring, brings down the season as a whole at all, because it, if you had to recall that the first half is, this is like the best season for Mike. This is like the Mike story. And this is something, of course, fans who watch Better Call Saul, where we get into Mike's backstory and he becomes an, a more developed character. Um, it kind of began here. Now, of course, we did get a lot of Mike in season three and four, but not as much as we got here. And I shouldn't need to give a spoiler warning because you should have seen this <laughs> the whole season before watching this video, but... Mike dies at the end of the first half of season five, so he's not even in the second half. And uh, so the first half is all about Mike, and that's when he shines the most, and this is when we see the most of him. This is when he's the biggest player, and I think it's absolutely spectacular. So that to say the first half, not quite as good as the second half, I mean, technically it's correct, like... <laughs> Being extremely awesome and great is not quite as good as perfection, but <laughs> it doesn't bring down the season at all. The first half is still uh, amazing. And then, of course, the second half is, uh, I think, television at its absolute best. So I stand by that you combine both halves into one season, you judge the whole season as a whole. Still the best season ever hands down well maybe not hands down there was a couple seasons that came close but to me this is always the the pure standard um now it's very interesting because it is the final season of the show and we we all know or we should know that breaking bad decided to end the show itself rather than being canceled and it went out when it was strongest went on his own terms and it is the singular best case. Like, it made the case as to why this was a good idea. As to why you should end the show on its own terms uh, rather than let it drag on well past its time. Uh, shows like, um, was it, uh, I'm trying to think of it, Dexter, 24, Walking Dead. Uh, a few other shows, they just they went, stretched it out for too long. They got greedy. They're like, let's keep the show going forever. Um, and they got irrelevant and it became bad and worse and ended up with boring endings. And the show ended up going way past its time to a, the point where it wasn't good anymore. And Breaking Bad made the best case of why you should end the show while it's still great and why you need to go out in the bank. I know that other shows took from this example and and would say, would use Breaking Bad as an example while we're ending the show in our own terms, we're ending it early like Breaking Bad did. Um, shows like Mr. Robot and uh, Black Sails and Game of Thrones, of course Game of Thrones, that, was, that ending was awful, but for totally different reasons, so I won't get into that here. Uh, and Black Sails did go out pretty strong but i think its final season was wasn't as good as his earlier seasons and mr robot really kind of i mean it was okay i guess the final season but it definitely kind of fumbled the ending a bit and was a bit disappointed and failed to live up uh to what it accomplished so even though they tried to accomplish what breaking bad accomplished they didn't quite do it i think breaking bad was still the gold standard of um going out on your all in your own terms and going out at the high point now as i stated in every single video i did for breaking bad i, I believe the show got better with each season leading to this uh grand final season which as i said i think is the best season ever uh 
I mean, as much as I love season four, and I've had heard the argument that season four is better than season five, uh, you know, and everyone's entitled to their opinion if they do believe that. But looking back on season four, as I covered in my season four review, it was did take a long time to get going. I mean, once it got into that final end stretch, it was fucking amazing. I will agree. Um, but it was kind of a bit they stretched it out and dragged out the story in that first half of the season it was kind of there was a lot of filler and um, and it was unnecessarily dragged out so i mean i've heard some people could compare that to season five and said well season five was kind of not as good as the first half and it wasn't until the second half to really shine but unlike season four i would say uh, even as i said the first half of season five was still great and it didn't feel stretched out or fillerish the way that the first half of season four did and actually even um at its worst it wasn't that bad um most of it was really engaging stuff and, and add it to the character stories, add it to the story, unlike um, the first half of season four, which a lot of it could have went, honestly. It was kind of unnecessary and kind of dragged the season overall. So, um, I think that season five is clearly the better season of the show. Now, to get back into <laughs> the origins of when I first watched the show, it is kind of ironic because I rented uh the dvds for season one and two and uh while season three was airing and then i found some <clears throat> other means to watch season three <laughs> and then um i watched uh oh yeah and then found some other means to watch season four as well because actually no i was watching the, them in dvds when season four was airing but season three was yet to come out on DVD, at least where I lived. So I had to find, I watched the first two on DVD and found some other means to watch three and four. And so I had finished watching season four during the break between seasons four and five. And, but I pretty much watched all four seasons in a row, kind of binge watched them all. Kind of, there was a little bit of a break. Well, whatever. Point is, I felt exhausted after watching season four, and I decided that I wasn't going to watch season five because I thought, like, the ending. And I, I've heard from uh, several other people who also felt this way that the ending with Walt and uh, Frank felt very definitive. And a lot, some people even said, went as far as to say the show should have ended there, which, of course, I couldn't disagree with more. Um, but I felt so drained <laughs> from the show that it was so, a bit depressing to watch and, and a bit much, uh, especially that ending that we got to. So I was just like, I can't do it. I can't watch season five. So the first half of season five aired and I didn't watch it. And then my and I told like friends about this and they were like, what are you crazy? No, 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 no. You need to go watch. You need to watch season five. You need to watch it. And I was like, all right, fine. So I binge watched the first half of season five. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. <laughs> this is amazing. Why did I ever give up on the show? And then I watched each episode of the second half of season five as it aired. And it was the only time in the show that I did watch each episode week to week. Because uh, all the episodes before that I binge, Which I don't know if that contributed to why I loved it so much. And why I thought each episode was pure gold. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that's why. I mean, it did give me time to ponder it each episode. And plus, I watched it like, um, because I was at film school at the time. And I watched it with a bunch of friends at film school in the theater that we had there. So I got to watch it like in the movie screen uh, each episode of the second half of, of season five. And sort of had that communal experience, which became very relevant in the episode Ozymandias when people were like were screaming in pain when like Hank died or when uh, Walt Jr. <laughs> was rejecting uh, Walt as like, and if someone like a couple guys even like fell on the floor, like, no, no. And it was a great communal experience to have, um, which also may be why I appreciated this season a lot more or that. But I do still stand by that the second half of season five stands for itself. Uh, that it was uh, absolute pure gold and the best that uh, television can ever be. Uh, and it was, and the thing with season five as a whole 
is that it is the perfect conclusion to this story. In fact, as I was watching uh, the second half of season, or the first half of season five again just recently, I kind of felt like I came to the conclusion that season five could really just be its own thing. Like, you don't even need the first four seasons. Like, you could... They were kind of just building to this. Like, you could release a show uh, with just this one season, and it would still be awesome and still stand on its feet. Now, it's, it is better because you have the backstory, of course. And particularly the first three seasons, like, kind of just leading up... To this I, I think season four pretty much stands on its own though but um the season is so good and such a self-contained story that it could it's like a story on it in on itself like you don't even need to watch the first four seasons to appreciate how awesome this is although it does it does probably build your appreciation of it knowing that backstory um and it is, it is a, a huge feat in that regard, because they pretty much did have to reinvent the show for season five, um, because it was kind of a stopping point in season four. Like I had a friend who also, like for the longest time, for many years, refused to watch season five. Uh, she was a huge fan of Gus Frank. She's like, I don't even want to watch the show without Gus Frank. And I was like, no, 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 you should, you should, you should. Um, it took me a long time to convince her. And even, she didn't even like, even after she watched it, she didn't like it as much. She was like, yeah, I guess Frank isn't it. It wasn't all that great. Um, which I disagree with personally. But, <laughs> but it was kind of a, like a natural stopping point. And they did have to sort of reinvent the show a little bit. They had to introduce a lot of new characters like Lydia and Todd and build like a sort of mythology. And uh, God, I can't even remember the names of the Nazis, the white supremacists, <laughs> Todd's uncle and whatnot that they joined with. Um, and I did hear some people give the criticism that, you know, after going, you went from Gus Fring this greatest villain in television of all time an unstoppable like cold-hearted calculated businessman who it was almost impossible to defeat and yet walt managed to defeat him and then walt uh ended up being defeated by some stupid nazi white supremacists who aren't even that smart um However, I think looking at it from that perspective kind of misses the point of Season 5. Season 5 is not the same as um, Season 3 and 4, where it was basically Walt, particularly 4, which is basically Walt versus uh, Gus. In fact, this is the way I described the show to my sister in an email once, that where Season 4... Uh, well, basically, there's the three tenets of storytelling. you got man versus... Uh, man, you got man versus nature or man versus himself. And season four was man versus man. Uh, it was Walt versus Frank. But season five was man versus himself. It was it was Walt versus his own inability. So that's the way I would say that Walt really wasn't ultimately defeated by the stupid white supremacists. He was defeated by his own pride by his own ego and in that way that's why i think this is the perfect story of breaking bad this is why i think it was the best this is what i think the whole entire show was leading to as i talked about in my season one review where he had that sort of um what was it called gray matter company that was like the foundation of why he got into selling drugs it wasn't just because he needed money because he had cancer that was really excuses because he wanted to feel uh the pride and of course it's no coincidence that the gray matter specifically comes back in a big way in this season where walt mentions it to jesse because jesse tries to convince him to quit and leave the business for a buyout and Walt brings up the fact that he was bought out for pennies on the dollar of what he could have made had he stand had he stayed in great matter and that he wasn't going to make that mistake again and then of course it also comes back how he uses his old friends at great matter as a, an excuse and means um to give all that money he made to his family because at that point his family wouldn't accept it um 
So, yeah, so it was the hubris. It was all about Walt's hubris, him versus himself, how he is basically, he is the one who defeats Walt. Walt Walter White is the one who defeats Walter White, not the Nazis. Uh, is his own arrogance, his own pride, and that's why everything ends up falling apart for him. And I think it's probably the best example of that. And, and it's such... Uh, such an amazing story and just thinking about that finale and I and you, and you know how I mentioned that I felt that um, season 5 or that season 5 was the best season of all of television I still think that the finale the final episode of Breaking Bad was the best series finale of all time now it's a bit closer with that one particularly with TNG's um all good things. It's a really close call, but I still give the slight edge to Breaking Bad, even though like the final episode of Breaking Bad uh, wasn't the best of the show. Like the episode Ozymandias, which I believe was to the third to last episode of the show, was actually the best. <laughs> so it was so the finale wasn't quite as good as Ozymandias, but it's still, in my opinion, the best finale of all time. It's the best way to wrap up the show that so many shows uh fumble on and get wrong um breaking bad managed to get it oh so bright oh so perfectly and i'll talk more about el camino of course in my part two uh review but i think el camino when that first came out so many people were like oh is this necessary is this necessary i don't think it's necessary is this really necessary and uh, my response is shut the fuck up of course it's necessary you imbecile like <laughs> el camino was the most necessary thing ever um but that was more of an epilogue but you needed to wrap up jesse's story now breaking bad was the story of walter white and so it made complete and total sense for Breaking Bad to end focusing on the end of Walter White. However, you had that hanging thread of Jesse who was also a very, 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 very important factor of Breaking Bad, of the show from its very conception, and so you needed his wrap-up. But it and it actually makes total and complete sense that it would be in a different medium and not in the show itself. Um, maybe they shouldn't have taken so long for <laughs> the movie to come out. But that's all good because they got to it eventually uh, as long as they did it and it was absolutely necessary and that's why i am including it in my review of breaking bad because i think it is part of the whole it is part of the whole that my, what makes this show so great that makes season five even though technically it wasn't part of season five uh it, it wraps up jeff's jesse's storyline from season five in an absolute perfect way so um yeah that's not even a question is it necessary that's like is the get grass green like don't even ask that uh anyway all right so that is enough of the preamble so let's go ahead and get into the episodes of season five let's start with the first episode live free or die and the one thing I have to say about this episode is, Yeah, bitch! Magnets! <laughs> now, it's funny that that's become like a big quote that a lot of people quote, but it's similar to uh, Luke, I am your father. It's actually misquote because most people will say, Magnets, bitch! Which he never actually said. He said, I quoted it correctly just now. He said, Yeah, bitch! Magnets! But so many people say, magnets, bitch! And that's not what he said. But <laughs> anyway, uh, as for the episode itself, let's talk what, about the uh, the opening scene that opens up the season, which I love this scene so much. And I love it more knowing that they had absolutely no idea what they were going to do in the second half of the season. They didn't know for sure how the, how the whole show would end. And yet... <laughs> they were setting the stage because I think they knew that of course 
something they had planned for the very beginning that the whole show was going to be about his rise and fall. So they knew that the ending of the show would be about his fall. And they knew that his pride would be his hubris and that it would lead to his downfall. But they didn't know at this stage any of the specifics. And they had stated several times in interviews that they kind of based the ending off of, of season five off of um, this scene. Like they didn't ha have this scene because they knew how the show was going to end and they were setting up for it. They actually based their ending and how they were going to plan how they were going to end it off of the scene that they already created. <laughs> um, which I think is, it's really, it's more impressive to me that they were able to do that because if you, some people talk about the difference between, um, backloaded storytelling and frontloaded storytelling where backloaded storytelling is like something like Star Trek Deep Space Nine where they make things up as they go along. And it's kind of obvious in some place. And the front line of storytelling is something more like Game of Thrones where they already know where they're going and they're sort of uh, uh, setting up, well, the, the TV show at least. I don't, I can't remember how the books were written. But the t show, anyway, they knew where they were going and so they were leading, having, creating everything that lead up to it. Uh, where Breaking Bad comes off as front-loaded storytelling if by watching season five in particular uh i like i think that oh of course they had everything planned because it comes together so perfectly so obviously they knew what they were doing but in fact it was in fact backloaded storytelling um i'm sorry um i think i got that reversed yeah backloaded <laughs> that they um that they um didn't know where they were going and they were kind of just making it up and so the fact that they, it ended up being so perfect and everything congealed so perfectly together is even more impressive in fact it's kind of ironic because when they did do front loaded storytelling season two with the whole purple bear thingy like they knew where they were going and that reveal was stupid <laughs> and so ironically seems to me that the writers of breaking bad work better if they make it up as they go along rather than plan it in, in advance um that, at least that's the way it appears to me because that scene um it shows if you don't recall the first scene that opens up the season it shows walter white a year later where he's ruffled and he uh, has a license, a New Hampshire's license plate, and he's buying like this huge like <laughs> machine gun from that arms dealer dude that we had seen previously. Um, and he, in most of the scenes about him sitting in the Denny's and reminiscing about his 53rd birthday, and he's celebrating alone. And he seems lonely and deteriorated, and uh, it's a really ominous way to set up the season too. And it's great the way that is actually not never paid off uh in the first half of season five um in fact the second half of season five begins with their own scene that continues on this um which i think is brilliant storytelling quite frankly uh it really leads that huge question mark and it's dangerous because if you don't like pay it off in a satisfying way that makes sense then it comes off as kind of uh, dumb. There are some examples of shows like <clears throat> Lost that did that a lot. They did their <laughs> front-loaded storytelling where they set up these interesting, intriguing mysteries that, oh my God, it's so interesting, I gotta keep watching. But then, of course, when they're never paid off in a satisfying manner, everyone's disappointed as showrunners and moved on. I was like, oh, why are you still worried about that? Which is a bullshit excuse. If you set something up, you shouldn't be surprised when your audience is disappointed when you don't pay it off in a satisfying manner. But this is paid off in a very extremely satisfying manner, so that's what makes it so brilliant. Uh, the rest of the episode, of course, <laughs> deals with the um, trying to destroy uh, the evidence of... Um, Gus Fring's laptop, and we had the whole magnets bitch <laughs> thing because um, they come up with a plan to use magnets. In fact, it's Jesse. What about magnets? When <laughs> um, Mike and Walt keep arguing with her, how are you going to do this? Blah, blah, blah. And Jesse keeps saying, oh, why don't we use magnets? <laughs> and they don't listen to him. They keep arguing. Like, that was great. Um, also, 
this is where we get the big confrontation between Mike and Walt because uh, Mike, of course, had just recovered from being shot in Mexico and he comes back to discover Gus Fring is dead and Walt killed him. And of course, his first instinct is to kill Walt in response to that. And but Jesse manages to talk him down and they manage to work together to prevent um, Gus's laptop into falling into the hands of the DEA because it has all of the footage, all the evidence of Walt and everyone, um, including Mike, being involved in cooking the meth. Um, now, there's a line at the end of the episode where uh, Hank says, oh, it's kind of pointless to destroy it because um, it was so encrypted we wouldn't be able to get into it anyway. And I think the episode's trying to tell you that uh, Walt's whole scheme was kind of for nothing, and like it was a waste of time because they didn't even need to destroy the laptop because they couldn't get into it anyway. And if that is what they're trying to imply, I think that kind of cheapens the story. But I also think that um, that's not the case. That that's actually not true because there's no encryption key that can't be broken through. It may take them a long time. They may have to uh, eventually hire like a expert hacker or whatever, but they could do it eventually over a certain amount of time. Uh, so I reject that notion that they never would have gotten to that footage. They most definitely would have. Therefore, what Walt did absolutely was necessary. Um, however, by doing so, uh, they caused them to um, discover something hidden in one of Gus's photos that has all the information for Madrigal, the company that he was using um, as the legitimate company he was using to uh, uh, distribute and finance his drug empire. And of course, Better Call Saul goes into more detail about Madrigal and how they're involved, which I love. Um, but that opens up a whole can of worms uh, for the rest of the season of uh, Hank being hot on the trail of uh, getting rid of all of Gus's contacts. So he kind of, so you could still make the argument that he kind of made things worse, <laughs> which I think definitely is what the show is hinting at, that he made things worse by the highest because it allowed them to find this information on Madrigal. But I would argue back that he would have been found out like, they would have broken the encryption on that laptop, no doubt. Uh, and they would have stole the footage of Walt. And he would have been caught red-handed in that situation. Which, to me, would be worse than what did happen. But anyway. Good episode. Really enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. So, next episode, um, it's called Madrigal. Uh, and it opens up with the really ominous scene of the uh, head of Madrigal in Germany... Uh, committing suicide like after like he this is she, she, I love these kind of opening scenes that seem kind of weird and out of place uh, where he's trying all these different sauces and then all of a sudden like uh, there's you know police banging at his door and he takes like a uh, I think it's a defibrillator or something and just kills himself with it and shocks himself to death um, and it's sort of indicating that um, everything that was because he was tied to Gus and I actually love again that Better Call Saul had that character and showed that he was in on it with Gus from the beginning and how they were planning everything uh, and how and now all fell apart and so he kills himself because of it uh, and it also but basically the whole episode from here gets into the whole um, network that Gus had because of course he had to have a, a legitimate network <laughs> in order to run such a huge empire like this and that he was a has to say a log, uh, legitimate uh, businessman for so long and and it makes sense that a lot of the legitimate contacts he had uh, were in fact not so legitimate and were in and on it with him um don't know why I was talking about like William Shatner just now but anyway <laughs> um so and this is the episode we meet Lydia, who is a great character. And this is, again, kind of the reason why I kind of feel Season 5 could be self-contained and stand on its own right, because it introduces characters like Lydia and plays off of this 
further and <laughs> she's such an interesting character and she does really stick in the mind how she has all her quirks about how she has to have the stevia thing and that she's very like shy she refuses to sit at the same table as mike and mike's like oh, all right it looks like i'm coming to you um and that's sh she begins by suggesting mike kill the 11 people in particular that know all about gus rings uh organization and they could burn everyone who was involved and there's kind of the lynch lynch pens or whatever you call it and um they become a very important factor for the rest of the season of course by the end of this episode those 11 people are nine people because lydia does hire one of those 11 people after mike refuses to kill him in fact mike is very extremely against it and suggests like <laughs> killing Lydia just for suggesting such a thing and saying all right it's time you get that stupid idea out of your head this isn't a movie but of course uh, Lydia doesn't get that stupid idea out of her head and she goes to one of the other 11 people and hires them to kill them all starting with Mike who he she now thinks is the most dangerous because he refused to do it and threatened to kill her for even suggesting it and so uh, she offered him even more money to kill Mike so the guy in question, I can't remember his name, but he uh, kills, starts with Chow, who's a character we actually did see previously. I believe it was season three that he was sort of acting up and Mike shoots him in the hand or whatever. Uh, so we already know he's involved with Gus's operation. And um, yeah, so this guy starts by killing Chow and using him as a bait to try to bring Mike in. Of course, Mike's too smart. To fall for the trap and he sees through it and manages to capture the guy and uh, kill him and immediately he's outraged that um, two people had to die because of Lydia and so he goes to kill her which is a very like hollering it's a great scene where he like sneak because you always think of night Mike as even though he's a criminal and whatnot and a killer he's you always think of him as a nice guy but he breaks into her home and threatens her whole family. In fact, she's, he's, you do have to wonder because he threatens Lydia. He says, if you make a sound, I will kill your housekeeper and your daughter. You have to wonder if Mike would, if was bluffing because I think he was. I don't think he would kill a four-year-old girl. I don't think he could do it. I, I, I really don't. I think he was saying that because, so he wouldn't have to. Uh, but if it came down to his feet, came down to the fire, and Lydia called his bluff, I don't think he would do it, personally. But of course, he knew that Lydia wouldn't call his bluff, because he knew that Lydia would do anything to protect her, her young girl. And that's what he was counting on, and that's why he said it. That's my interpretation of this scene. But God damn, it was still such a great scene. And it's interesting, because, let me backtrack in the episode a bit, because... You have Walt, of course, uh, proposes to Mike and Jesse that they go in on it and that they form their own sort of uh, drug lord, <laughs> um, empire and sort of build off of what Frank had used in the past. And Mike, of course, is very opposed to the idea and flat out says, no, I don't want to work with you. You're a time bomb just waiting to go off. And it is interesting it's kind of a bit of foreshadowing because we see later in the season that mike was in fact correct and mike was smart enough to see this that walt uh, cannot be sustained that he was a time bomb waiting to go off and he was 100 percent correct however this is where these nine guys come into play because they're what changed Mike's mind because these nine guys have all been arrested the DA suspects them but they're being paid off uh, by Fring's money to keep quiet and Mike of course feels loyal to them as we see he absolutely was have refused to kill them and uh, goes off to kill Lydia because she tried to kill them uh, so he's very loyal to them and wants them to survive and wants to keep paying them off to support their families and uh, keep them around and he no longer has the means of money to do that so he needs to uh go in on it with that's what changes his mind to 
accept Walt's offer. In fact, Walt and Jesse's first issue is not having methylamine in order to uh, cook more meth. And then he realizes when he's about to kill Lydia that she has would have the ability, she would have access to the methylamine, and she would be able to continue the business. So that's what saves her lives. That's what changes Mike's mind. Again, you can tell it's against his better judgment that he decides that that's the only way to keep the money flowing for these night guys and to keep them safe and to keep them quiet. Uh, the only way to do that is to um, accept Walt's offer and keep Lydia alive so that she can help in this operation. And goddamn, that was pretty damn powerful. Um, another scene I think is very interesting in this episode is when, uh, with Hank... He's kind of seen as a hero now because he actually correctly predicted that Gus Fring owned a meth empire even when he was laughed at by all of his superiors. And now he's seen as sort of um, a hero. And uh, Hank's boss, because he rejected Hank and thought his idea was silly, is now getting fired because of it and Hank feels really bad. And... There's a lot of irony in the scene, and they were definitely setting you up <laughs> for what would happen in the second half of the season because the, uh, I can't forget his name, the ASAC or whatever, the head of the department was getting fired. He kept saying, I can't believe, like, I, w I had dinner with Gus Fring, I was friendly with him, we chatted, and he's the reason why he taught me this recipe that I still use all the time, and he was there under my nose the whole time. And I couldn't see it. I was blinded by it. And what beautiful foreshadowing that is. <laughs> because when Hank finds out that Walt uh, was, in fact, um, Heisenberg. And in fact, like, even, you could say that's even, uh, you could say it's even relevant to this point in time. Because Hank is, someone close to Hank is actually in a huge drug lord unbeknownst to him so it is there's a lot of irony in the scene uh which i really appreciate it <laughs> when this rewatch uh so again this is another great episode i love this episode too uh and again setting us up for a really great season five all right so uh we get into the next episode which is hazard pay which gets into after mike agrees to go in on it with Walt and Jesse, obviously against his better judgment. Um, and you get a lot of the great interactions between Walt and Mike uh, in this episode and how they're working with Saul to try to, to set up um, uh, this empire. Now, I'm just going to jump back in the previous episode real quick because there's something I forgot to mention. I also think it was very important. Is that when Saul suggest to Walt that they just quit while they're ahead. Walt points out that he is broke and that he owes Jesse a lot of money because he had to borrow money from Jesse in order to pay off the magnets guy uh, to destroy the laptop. He's like, I'm broken in the hole. So what makes you think this is I'm ahead? What makes you think this is a good stopping point? Uh, which was a pretty good argument. And uh, it is kind of ironic, too, that Jesse was, like, so willing, like, when Walt asked to borrow the money, Jesse's like, yeah, sure, which is ironic, back in season two, Jesse, something happened to his half of the money, and he asked Walt to borrow it, and Walt was like, no, fuck you, you're just gonna smoke it all, whatever, and being a total dickhead about it, it just shows how much better Jesse is as a person than Walt, but anyway... Getting to this episode, um, it deals with them. You have that nice dynamic between the three of them. And, of course, Walt is very highly motivated to keep cooking and to get things in motion. And he wants Mike, of course, to handle the business side of things while he and Jesse handle the cook. But they need, they need a place to cook because, of course, that underground lab is no more. And um, they don't want to cook in RVs anymore. He wants to stay in Albuquerque, which Saul warns is more risky, but they want to make it work. And so they go all these different places and they, everyone finds a reason to reject it. And, and Saul gets sick of it. And he takes him to this, like, um, what is it called? Like Terminator and in insect 
type uh, place um, exterminated. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, and um, he's like, Saul's like, okay, who's going to reject this first? And Jesse's like, all right, I'll start. Blah, blah, blah. This doesn't work. And then Walt, to everyone's surprise, is like, actually, this is perfect. And, you know, even Mike and Jesse are like, what, coke here? And he's like, no, not here. And he points to the tent. And that's where they have the idea to um, cook in houses that are being exterminated because everyone knows to stay out of the tenant houses and there's a team of criminals who run this extermination thing so they're more than happy to work with Walt and we meet the head of this team can't remember his name but he made a cameo in, in Better Call Saul which shows how he met Saul in the first place which, <laughs> which I, I, again I love these kind of tying off loose ends but this of course is when we meet Todd who becomes the, an important character for the rest of the season. At this point in, st in time, he's just some background guy who's like, yes, Mr. White, yes, sir, or whatever, and that's all very interesting. Um, and, yeah, we get the uh, the sort of setup when uh, Walt and Jesse are setting up their cook. And, uh, yeah, very interesting stuff. And I love how... And we get in a bit into Jesse's relationship with Andrea because he's still with her and Brock. But this kind of makes this part of the thing that makes me hate Walt the most is that he, when he was having this co casual conversation with Jesse, he seems like he's being a good friend and saying, like, oh, how's things going with Andrea? But really, you find out he's just manipulating him and he, like, breaks his, like, so how much does she know? And Jesse, like, that's when it clicks in his head. It's like, fuck, he's not just having a con casual conversation. He's interrogating me about who could possibly know about this. And he's like, look, man, she doesn't know anything. But eventually, like, he, like, sows these seeds of doubt in Jesse's mind that makes him think. And he's like, well, I trust me, I've been through this myself. That makes Jesse break up with Andrea. And I hate that. I really hate that Walt did that. And I hate that Jesse fell for it. Not that I'm, well, let me specify, I don't hate it as in the storytelling device, because as a storytelling device, I think it's great, and it totally makes sense for the characters, but I hate Walt in the universe as a person <laughs> for doing that, it's just so despicable. Um, but yeah, and then we also see, of course, more sort of conflict between Mike and Walt because Mike wants to use a good portion of the of their profits to pay off the nine guys which Walt is totally not okay with and Mike like rightfully points out that he's just like picking pennies at this point even though they're, even though they're talking about millions of dollars is still compared to what they're making it's just a tiny fraction and Mike's like look you know if this is the cost of doing business you want me to be in charge of uh of the business side of things, this is part of it, and Walt grudgingly agrees, but he has that sort of line to Jesse, where he's like, you know why, you know, I can't remember who he's talking about, they died because they flew too close to the sun, so he's, he's getting really iffy about Mike here, and this is when <laughs> Walt's becoming... Very arrogant and a very dangerous, sort of stuck on his own head thinking he's this huge crime boss. Anyway, um, we get into the next episode, which is 51. And this is the episode I would point out as kind of the weak point of the season. Um, I, I didn't... I didn't think this was a bad episode, don't get me wrong. Uh, I don't think there were any bad episodes this season. But it was definitely kind of the slowest. It dealt more with the Skyler storyline, which to be fair, I didn't care as much for. I forget, I've been forgetting the touch on it so far. Like in the first episode, she had that, she resolved the whole thing with Ted, which I thought was kind of interesting because Ted was being such an idiot and asshole in the previous season. All she has to, and right away he's like, I'll do whatever you say, just don't hurt me anymore. And she's like, good. So he's finally come around. Uh, and I did like how they just resolved that and got that out of the way because we didn't need more of that. Um, but from there, Skylar became terrified of Walt and throughout the season throughout this first three episodes she was just like 
barely saying anything and Walt and it's obvious that she didn't love him and she hated being around him and Walt was like oblivious to it and kept trying to win her over but she's just like yeah yeah and just refusing to talk because she's scared out of her mind so in this episode is when Walt finally addresses that and things come to a head with that and we get the line that I absolutely love where Walt tries to reassure her not to be scared. Everything's fine because he points out that Gus Fring is dead. So everything's safe now because Gus Fring was the danger. But then I love, I absolutely love the retort where she says, I thought you were the danger, <laughs> which gets back to his whole, I am the one who knocks speech in season four, where he said, I am the danger. Um, and I love the way she throws that back in his face. Uh, <laughs> and and then, of course, uh, she has that breakdown in, uh, when they're having dinner with uh, Hank and Marie where she um, tries to drown herself. Um, but, of course, that was just a ploy to get uh, Walt Jr. And, um, God, I can't even remember the daughter's name, but the, the infant daughter to get them to uh, stay with Hank and Marie because she thinks it's no longer safe to live there. Uh, despite Walt's insurances, because as soon as she knows that he's cooking again, she feels it's not a safe environment for her children to live. And I love how um, she like casually tries to suggest, oh, why don't we send them away to boarding school? And Walt's like, what? What the hell are you talking about? That's a stupid idea. And so she has, has to do something a bit more backhanded to get them out of the house. And you get the conversation with Walt saying, you're trying to take my kids from me. Um, but... It implies like there's going to be huge conflict between Walt and Skylar over this, but Walt actually lets it go eventually and kind of lets her win this one um, because it keeps her... And then, again, this is where he, he puts his greed and shows his greed and his desire to be this crime lord, empire-building, you know, um, bad guy. His desire to be that man is more is larger than his desire to help his family, to be with his family. Um, because he does have the opportunity, even after he pays off his debts and he's not broke anymore, he has the opportunity to end it and just be with his family. But he refuses because he's into empire building, which I'll get to shortly. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so it shows that his whole thing is like, I do this for my family is full shit. And Skylar's sick of hearing it. Uh, and so she holds him the task. And the fact that he does give a, give in to her rather than quit, um, that he just lets the kids live somewhere else, is because that she will keep working and laundering the money. So his having her do that is more important to him than being with his family. Interesting note. Um, so... Anyway, we also get this side plot in this episode where Jesse goes to pick up the methylamine from Lydia and they discover a bug on it and they're all freaked out and Jesse and Mike are freaked out and Mike wants to quit and Walt's like, nothing stops. We have to find a way to keep going because they don't have methylamine anymore. Which leads into the next episode, which is Dead Freight. Now, I gotta admit something about this episode. I mentioned in my intro that I didn't watch season five at first. Like when the first half was airing, I just like, I didn't think I was going to watch it. And I binge watched it later on. However, I did randomly one night flip in on the channels and turn, saw that Breaking Bad was on. And I thought, Oh, I'll just watch this episode. Uh, even though it was out of context and I knew it would be out of context. And it was this episode and ironically, I didn't like it. When I watched this episode out of context, I was like, I just thought, oh, this is pretentious. No, I'm so glad I stopped watching the show. Uh, this is just <laughs> artsy and pretentious and ridiculous. And I can't believe now that that was my reaction to this episode. Because after watching it in context, like even the first time where I binge watched the season and I watched it in context, I was like, oh my god. This episode's amazing. Why the hell would I ever think that it's not good? Um, 
and especially now after I've seen the whole season, I'm fermented that this is one of the best seasons of all time or the best season of all time. I'm just shocked that my initial reaction was this episode was no good. <laughs> I just, I don't, I, it's weird now as an exercise that if you watch something, if I watch something out of context, that even a great episode I might think is not so good. Interesting thing to learn. Anyway, um, although I will say some people hold this up as the best episode of the show or one of the best episodes of the show, and I'm not so sure I agree with that. I do really like this episode, don't get me wrong. I just wouldn't say it was one of the best of the show. Like, I'm going to do a top 30 um, Breaking Bad episodes after I cover all Breaking Bad, and this might make my top 30, maybe, but... I don't think it will make my top 20, and it definitely won't make my top 10. So, yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, because this is my, mainly just like a heist episode. And I don't know, I think Breaking Bad has actually done much better than heist episodes. But it's a really good heist episode. <laughs> to be fair, it is really intense. And I do love the setup. I love the scene where they get Lydia and Mike just wants to kill her. And Walt kind of has, has to talk him down. And uh, Lydia sort of... And they're convinced that uh, Lydia planted... And Mike's convinced that Lydia planted the bug herself. And then they bug uh, Hank's office to find out if that's true or not. And they find out that... Uh, it is in fact... even The first they find out that Hank didn't do it. So they're ready to kill Lydia. And she's like, no, begging for her life. But then they hear Hank talking to another department. And they did it. And then she's like, you fuckers. <laughs> you were about to kill me for something I didn't do. Um, but Walt's... I mean, Mike still wants to kill her, though. He still just does not like her. And his feelings on her is actually quite justified, as we'll get into in the second half of the season. Um, but they manage... Instead, she suggests a train heist uh, of where she describes an ocean of methylamine that would keep them set for life and they come up with this and of course Mike at first saying this is impossible you can't hijack it or whatever but Walt comes up with the genius plan to hijack the train but make it so no one ever knows about it that and part of the point of it was that they wanted to avoid killing the uh, train conductors I mean, partly it wasn't like, oh, because we killing is bad and we don't want to hurt anyone. A lot of it had more to do with killing them will make us wanted men and will make it harder for us to get away with it. Um, but I do think, and especially from Jesse's side of thing, that not wanting to murder people was definitely a huge part of it. So uh, they come up with this other ingenious plan to... Um, hijack the all the methylamine and replace it with water so and when they find out that it's all watered down they'll just assume that they got ripped off or whatever and so they will never know that uh the train was heist and they enlist the help of todd and, and it's funny at this point in stage he is kind of unknown kind of background character just a you know petty thug is kind of all they know about him but he's really willing to learn from Walt and Jesse calls them sir and is very respectful for him and this is the episode we find out that he is in fact uh, a sociopath <laughs> who has no sense of right and wrong whatsoever and is really ironic because Jesse sort of drills him his head he's like it's important no one ever finds out about this ever do you understand no one can may, can ever know and of course Jesse's thinking about you know him blabbing his mouth like you can't just blab your mouth you want to make it sure that he can't tell anyone not the slightest person and he's like okay 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 definitely yes sir just he's not realizing <laughs> that he kind of took it in a different way because there is a witness to them a young boy and of course we see this young boy in the opener of the episode and he riding his dirt bike and he just stumbles across uh, Walt, Jesse, and Todd right after they pulled off this height. And, uh, of course, Todd makes this to me. No one can ever know, so there should be no witnesses, so he kills the kid. 
In fact, if we see in the next episode, Todd's actually surprised that Jesse and, and Walt have a problem with it because he assumed that's what they meant. Because he's a sociopath and he doesn't see anything wrong with just shooting a young boy like that. Um, and that was a devastating way uh, to end the episode. And it was, goddamn, such a strong, powerful ending. Now, I also want to say it is interesting we get Bill Burr again making a return as he um, helps uh, the highest by parking a truck in the middle of the way and we get a lot of scenes with him talking to the conductors trying to delay them and it not working out uh, that was kind of funny anyway uh, yeah great episode did like it even though I don't think it's one of the best of the show I still think it was a really intense episode alright so next episode was buyout that deals with the aftermath, of course, and I love it. it opens up with Todd trying to have ca casual conversation with Jesse, and as soon as he brings up the kid, Jesse just punches him, and they have to decide whether or not they want to get rid of Todd, and ultimately they decide the best way uh, is to not make an enemy out of him, so to keep him on board where they can keep an eye on him, uh, but keep him on a short leash. And, uh, however, shortly after, we see the trauma this causes Jesse because we do know in the past how much Jesse cares for children and how he, um, um, can't abide by murdering it and how this really haunts him and the guilt of this incident will be a major factor for the rest of the season. Uh, on his decisions and that he can't be involved in this anymore. We also find out that Mike uh, is uh, being hunted by Hank, who's getting closer and closer to finding him out, so Mike is in danger of being caught because there's, uh, of course, he continues to pay you know, the, his nine guys to this lawyer, and Hank has kind of caught on to that a bit. And so Mike, when he tells... Uh, Walt about this, Walt flips out and is like, okay, Mike, yeah, you're right. You should leave. There's no other way. I guess we'll, Jesse will just take over the business side. But Jesse's like, uh, no, <laughs> I'm not going to take over the business side. And so um, Walt absolutely refuses to leave to quit. So they have to, um, Jesse and Mike decide to sell two thirds of their methylamine um, so they can you know, make out for get $5 million each, which is as they keep telling walls, nothing to bulk at. And they go to uh, Colonel Young from Stargate SGU, <laughs> Stargate Universe. Uh, <laughs> and it's funny, later in the second half of the season, they refer to this guy as looking like Hugh, Hugh Jackman. And I never made that connection before, but as soon as I saw him, I was like, hey, it's Colonel Young. But anyway, <laughs> um... He doesn't. He wants to get the blue meth out of the market, so he refuses to buy two thirds of the meth. I mean, he only will buy all of it. And so Jesse comes over and has a conversation with Walt to try to convince him to sell out his uh, part of it, and he absolutely refuses. And this is when the whole gray matter issue comes up where, and I don't think they ever told us specifically just how bad a situation was that Walt took a buyout for $5,000 for a company that is now worth billions. And that, I, that really does explain a lot about Walt's character and why he's so prideful and why he reacts the way that he does. I think is a huge, I mean, because we already knew part of the gray matter story. Uh, but I don't think we knew this specific that he was bought out by $5,000 and the company is now worth billions. Uh, that is a huge deal. <laughs> and also explains his, he uh, describes it now as um, why he refuses to sell out. And Jesse, of course, tries to say $5 million is not 5000 <laughs> It's not pennies on the dollar. But Walt correctly says we could make way more than that, and I absolutely refuse to. And this is where his greed and his pride and everything shows up. And then we, but we get this awkward dinner scene between Jesse, Skyler, and Walt, which I love uh, because 
Jesse, when Skylar comes home, Jesse's like, oh shit, you caught me here. I should just go. But Walt's like, no, stay for dinner. And this is total, a total power play. This is his way of saying, now nah, fuck you, Skylar. This is my house. I live here. If I want to have guests over for dinner, I'll fucking have guests over for dinner. And of course, you can tell that that's why he's doing it and she's not too happy about it but there's nothing she can do about it but she is not a very good conversationalist during dinner that and the fact that she found out that uh, Walt had told Marie about the affair she had with Ted now of course Walt had told Marie this as a way to distract from why uh, Skylar was so upset and depressed uh, but Skylar still didn't appreciate that and I love that line they have at dinner where, where Jesse mentions like, oh, I heard you run the car wash really well. And he's like, oh, really? What else does my husband tell you about him? Did she? Did he tell you that I had an affair? <laughs> and he just like drinks while it's in the, Like the awkward dinner conversation that Jesse tries to have with her is, is just hilarious. But, um, yeah, so I actually like that scene. Um, however... Uh, after Jesse was unable to convince Walt to sell his deal, Mike decides to force the issue and holds uh, Walt captive while they sell all of it. And Walt's like, oh, you're stealing it from me. He's like, no, I'm still going to give you your $5 million. Like, you should, <laughs> I've never, he's like, I've never seen someone work so hard to refuse $5 million. However, um... Mike gets called out on a DEA legal thing with his lawyer, so it's something that he can't refuse, it's something he can't turn down, it's something he has to show up on. And uh, while he's away, uh, Wall, of course, like d <laughs> manages to get himself free by like doing damage to his own wrist, so it tells you. Like, how much he was willing to, like, burn himself, like, and suffer this excruciating pain in order to get free. And, of course, steals the methylene. And Mike, of course, is pissed eye hell. And his first reaction is to kill Walt. But Walt correctly points out that if he does, he'll never find the methylene. And Jesse is like, um, just wait, hear his proposal. He has a way... He's come up with a plan and we that we he gets to keep his methylamine and we get to get our our million dollar payouts. Uh so yeah. Really liked that episode too. <laughs> I felt that was pretty intense and a really good setup for the next episode, which is Say My Name. <laughs> um so that leads up to this where we get the um confrontation with Colonel Young or the guy who looks like Wolverine. And um, Walt's plan is that he use, because now he's in need for distribution and someone who handled the distribution business side of things, now that Mike and can't be a factor anymore. And so his plan is to use uh, Wolverine or <laughs> Colonel Young for distribution and that has a finder's fee, he'll give Mike the five million dollars so that um, Mike can have his five million just as it was originally planned, so that would satisfy him. Everyone's happy, as he says. And of course, I love, I fucking love this scene at the start of the episode where he is negotiation, negotiating with Colonel Young. And he's like, Who the hell are you? And he gets finally gets him to say, Say my name. It's like, You're Heisenberg. You're God damn right. That is an, an iconic scene of the show, and for a very good reason. It does show like how much of to the dark side Walt has gone. How he does see himself as this badass crime lord, a drug lord now, and that he he's just fit into that role, and that's who he really is now. Um. But in the, um the rest of the episode. Uh, Jesse is tries to keeps continuing tries to reinsert like look I'm out too like how are you gonna find a way to get me my five million and Walt keeps pu pushing him off me like yeah yeah sure we'll figure something out in the meantime why don't you help me cook and <laughs> Jesse has to keep reinserting like no 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 you don't get it like I'm out I he's like yeah sure I know you're out whatever but just help me cook uh, and eventually that comes to a head 
where Jesse has to get right in his face and be like, um, no, I'm serious. I'm fucking out. And even though Walt tries to, I know you're upset over the kid's death, blah, blah, blah. And he, he's just not listening to Jesse. That is tearing him up in the inside. And he absolutely cannot stand to be involved anymore. Uh, and eventually, when Jesse tries to explain this to him and is more forceful about it, that's when Walt loses his shit and he feels abandoned. And he's like, well, fuck you. You get nothing. You get nothing. And just kicks him out. Um, and that's because, and again, this is Walt's pride. He's being kind of childish here. And it does show how really how much of a bad friend he is to Jesse and how Jesse is a much better friend to him. Um... But then the situation comes to head with Mike because Hank actually successfully got to Mike's lawyer that he was using to pay off the nine guys. And the lawyer flips and he gives up uh, Mike and um, Walt finds out about this from the bug he had on Hank and manages to warn Mike before he's caught and arrested. But Mike, of course, has to flee town immediately, but he left his money in a truck and he tells Saul to go get it but Saul's like I'm that's not a good idea because I'm your lawyer I'm being watched and it's actually kind of ironic after seeing Better Call Saul uh, season 5 in particular uh, where we did see Saul play the role of a bag man before and that he did not have a very good experience <laughs> in that role and so that actually also helps inform why he would refuse to do it right now and and that is actually i hadn't thought of that that is actually very interesting uh and jesse agrees to do it but mike doesn't want jesse to do it because um he's too protective of jesse which as we f will find out shortly was actually a very bad call so instead walt agrees to do it and again if mike was smart he would have just let jesse do it but walt does it and walt of course is you know pissed off with mike and and tells him like look i need the name of your nine guys and it's obvious why he wants the name of the nine guys because he wants to kill them and that's something mike can't uh, abide and then they get into a huge argument um because mike because walt blames mike for being caught saying that it's his fault that he got burned but mike sees it from the uh different side saying it's all walt's fault for killing gus fring because they had a, a beautiful thing they had a great thing they could have all made money but walt fucked it up because of his pride and his ego and because of he couldn't just shut up and do what he was told and know his place that he had to be in charge and kill fring now I gotta stop and interject here because I actually, and I, this is something I've always felt ever since I first saw this episode, I totally and completely disagree with Mike's uh, assertion here, with his point of view. I think Mike is, is outright wrong. Now, it is obvious that the show has been telling us, and the whole point of the show is that Walt's um, ego and his pride is his biggest downfall. That's something I've been saying, and that's definitely... Uh, a key point of the show however in the case of Gus Fring it wasn't Walt's ego or pride that led him to kill Gus Fring it was the fact that Gus Fring was going to kill him and uh, so Mike is absolutely wrong when he says if you would have just shut up and known your place everything would have been fine actually Mike Jesse would be dead if he just shut up and known his place. And it wasn't uh, Walt's ego that led him to defy Gus. It was his loyalty and uh, need to protect Jesse. And it's funny because Mike is now being very protective of Jesse and sees Jesse as a great guy. Uh, but in back in season three, when this conflict between Walt and Gus first began mike was the one who suggested that walt kill jesse he's forgetting that <laughs> and i do think that i do honestly think that the showrunners are trying to get us to believe that it was my uh walt's ego and pride and hubris that uh as was the downfall and so i think they're wrong I think that's kind of i do kind of chalk this up as a little bit of bad writing here uh Although you could chalk it up to just Mike being 
wrong and Mike rewriting history in his head, but I think is I think the writers are trying to get the audience to believe that Mike is correct because it, Walt's pride is his downfall. However, it doesn't apply to this specific situation because uh, the reason why he killed Fring was because Fring was trying to kill him actively. And the reason why Fring was actively trying to kill him is because he refused to kill Jesse and help protect Jesse. Therefore, it wasn't his pride, it was his friendship. It was a good quality that put him at odds with Frank. It's his wanting to protect Jesse. And he didn't have to protect Jesse. He could have shut up, done his job, made tons and tons of money. But he would not allow a friend and someone he saw as kind of a son figure, uh, a surrogate son, to be murdered because of it. So it was actually a good quality that put him at odds with Frank. And of course, in season four... It was either kill Frank or be killed. So shut up and know your place and just do your job actually wasn't an option at that stage because if he just shut up and did his job, he would be dead. So either he would be dead or either Jesse would be dead. That's what led them to kill Frank. Not hubris, not ego, not pride. So he's totally wrong here. But <laughs> it is still it is still an amazing scene. It is still a great scene. Um having that that argument uh between mike and walt and of course mike doesn't realize how dangerous walt is by saying know your place like as soon as he said that i'm like "Uh uh-oh (laughs) like that is not what you say and of course it pissed walt so much pissed him off so much that he went and got the gun and shot mike before even thinking about it and that's why this is such a great intense scene because you know that even though that you know that that Walt got the gun set the gun aside, it's obvious that he wasn't premeditating that he wasn't pre-planning to murder Mike. He probably just wanted the gun for safekeeping. But when Mike, like, totally like yelled at him and told him know your place, like. He's a prideful, arrogant idiot, and of course that that hurt his pride way too much. So his first reaction would be like, "You know what? Here's your place, and the bull in your fucking gut. Fuck you." And and it's obvious it was in the heat of the moment, and that Walt completely and totally rejected it. I mean, uh, regretted it right after he did it, and I was amazing acting. And I like how when Walt goes up to Mike as he's sitting by the river dying and he tries to apologize. And like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then he tries to start to make excuses for it. And Mike's just like, shut the fuck up and let me die in peace. Oh, my God. (laughs) Like, what an amazing, amazing ending. So I love this episode. I think this episode's absolutely amazing. So we get then get into the follow-up episode, which is another amazing episode called Gliding All Over. Uh, it's an interesting episode because it really it goes it's does a lot of time jumps. It covers a long period of time. Um, at first it gets into um, you know, they're dealing with the, the aftermath and um, Walt, of course, hides the fact that, <laughs> that he killed Mike and tries to make it off as uh, he Mike left. He's living in peace. And, of course, they'll use the whole Belize thing in season in the second half of the season. Um, but and then when Jesse shows concern, he's like, well, I thought you were you were out, remember? And I think this is when he has this sort of yelling at Jesse when Jesse absolutely refuses and saying, you get nothing! And he gets no money. And, uh, (laughs) um... But, and so he cooks, he has Todd as his assistant instead. The sociopath child killer. Good choice. And, uh, but, you know, they do imply that Todd never becomes as good as Jesse, but he is a, um competent enough uh sibling but of course walt still has the uh hanging chad of the um the nine guys that could destroy his whole empire because they knew too much about it and then you have that nice conversation with lydia where he goes to get the list of the nine guys from lydia uh and she uh of course is very paranoid and just assumes walt's gonna kill her 
uh, right after she gives the list. And he's like, well, if you don't give me the list, then I definitely have no use for you. <laughs> um, but then she comes up with another plan to sell uh, his meth in uh, the Czech Republic. And how she has the distribution set up perfectly. And she could double his profits. And then I could see his pride and his ego. Ooh, double my profits. Ooh, and that really sold him. Uh, so he went along with it. And I uh, got the list. And then so he goes to Todd's uncle. Who Todd mentioned in passing earlier. Who has a lot of connection in prisons. And this is when we first meet him. I will learn his name by part two, I promise. I can't remember his name at the top of my head. We meet, first meet him in this. It's funny because he comes like the main villain of like the final episodes. And yet he's first introduced in this episode almost halfway through the final season. As I said, he was never really the point of the... Because he is kind of a shitty villain compared to Gus, but he's not the point. Like, it, the whole point is Walt versus himself. But anyway, we meet him in this episode, and Walt uh, gets him to um, pull off the heist. It's pull off the killing all nine guys within a, a time frame of, like, I think it was two minutes. Uh, because they realize, because they realize if they kill them, if they start killing some of them off, then the other ones will be put in protective custody immediately so that they won't be killed. So in order to, for it to be done right, they all have to be killed off all at the same time. Uh, and he's like, oh, even killing Bin Laden wasn't this, uh, wasn't this difficult. Which the showrunners have later admitted that uh, the time frame was actually off because uh, each... Because Breaking Bad takes place over a short amount of time. It's not like each season's a year. It takes, like, the whole show takes over place over, like, two years or something. Or uh, particularly up to this point. There's more time jumps, of course, towards the end of season five. But at this point, it's only been, like, a year and a half or two years. And therefore, uh, they're not in the actual time that this episode's airing. So the death of Bin Laden actually occurred after the point in time that this is supposed to be taking place and they've admitted their error before <laughs> which i think is interesting but anyway um but he's just like find a way and i think that i don't know it just shows that kind of the badass criminal he sees himself as and so uh you know white supremacist dude uh does find a way and you get that scene which i thought was absolutely amazing where they played it to um like, I want to say Frank Sinatra, but I don't know if it, ex it is Frank Sinatra. If it's not, it's Frank Sinatra-esque song, uh, Pick Yourself Up. And they play, and had that montage of all the guys in prison being killed. God damn. <laughs> and, and, like, they intercut that with scenes of Walt just drinking his scotch while staring out the window, looking at his timer and his clock. And as soon as the times comes up and all the guys are dead, he gets a call from uncle guy who's just like it's done and he just hangs up the phone it does show how dark twisted and fucked up walt has become uh he is a crime lord he is the uh, the uh, crime boss at this stage uh god damn i mean that scene illustrated it so perfectly and it was just so powerful i mean just seeing all those people like being murdered and like killed in very vicious ugly ways you see you know people getting repeatedly stabbed people getting beaten to death a guy getting burned alive while he's screaming like and it was all done by walt and he just has a cel celebratory drink of scotch after it's all done. Like, fuck. And in fact, like, I love the Hank's part of it because Hank is with, like, a group of, like, schoolgirls or whatever doing publicity shots or whatever. And when Gomez comes in and tells them the news. Now, to me, this scene is very reminiscent of how George W. Bush was, like, with a school group of school children like doing publicity thing when 9-11 happened and people like tried to usher him in and tell him about it i'm sure that the uh resemblance is intentional um but you see how hank was shaken to the core over this that he was so badly shaken up and you see him having a conversation with walt later 
uh, where he he just doesn't know what he just wished that he had a different job. He's like, I can't believe, like he's just in all the whole brutality of it. And I love how before this happened, he was going out to the various nine guys and and they were trying to cut a deal with him. And he's like, seriously, you want me to set you free? Fuck no. This is a buyer's market. I got eight other guys I could go to. So you better try to sell trying to sell me something better so he thought he was home free and then he gets the news that all nine guys who were in various prisons were all killed at the exact same time and he's just in awe of the other brutality and he couldn't even imagine that it's his family member his brother-in-law someone who's almost one of the closest family members that he has who pulled it off it like he couldn't even imagine that and then you have that scene with jesse which is a very important scene where walt goes to jesse after jesse is apparently he's not in a good place and he's just hiding out in his house and walt shows up randomly and starts reminiscing about old times about uh be cooking in the rv and it seems to be uh you know having a good old time and jesse's sort of going along with it and eventually jesse's like look man i got things to do and well it's like yeah yeah no worries hey i left you a, a present outside a gift and jesse like goes out and there's this like duffel bag it was cute i think maybe several duffel bags and jesse is like very suspicious like slowly starts to open it and when he sees that his money he brings it inside he starts crying and freaking out and we see that he had a gun in his hand the whole time uh so apparently he had thought that walter had come there to kill him he thought that walter was uh tying up loose ends which isn't um uh, necessarily a crazy notion considering that walter had nine people in prison killed simultaneously in order to tie up loose ends so i it's not too crazy to think and especially the way that they parted last war he was like you got nothing that he would come back and try to kill him and apparently jesse was like freaked out the whole time <laughs> this might be the case but it turns out that no he actually walt wanted to set things right with jesse and give him the money that he deserved um and because jesse was supposed to give five million dollars and they don't specify how much walt gave jesse but i'm pretty sure it looks like more than five million dollars to me but i don't know maybe it is but um and then jesse starts crying and freaking out uh so it does show that walt is a better person than jesse thinks because jesse assumed the worst of him assumed that he was coming there to kill him and uh and this will carry on on in the second half of season five well jesse will constantly think walt is worse or thinks his intentions are worse than what they actually are so one could say that jesse is uh, judging Walt unfairly, and to some extent he is, but he kind of deserves it. <laughs> like, as Jesse's not too crazy to have this negative opinion of Walt, because Walt, there's so many uh, examples throughout the five seasons of Walt totally screwing Jesse over because of his pride and being a dick like the time he refused to lend him money, or, you know, <laughs> of course, we know as the audience, and Jesse isn't even aware of it at this stage, that Walt had, uh, participated in his girlfriend's death, uh, and caused it, and poison the, the young boy that jesse was looking after <laughs> so walt is even worse than what jesse knows and of course the way that walt was like you got nothing was a huge asshole thing to do so you can understand jesse's feeling that um that walt would be worse than his and you could say oh jesse's wrong about walt walt's actually uh not that bad of a guy not really. Has we has I just stated the whole two examples? He's not even aware of. Walt's in some cases and some terms is even worse than what Jesse knows, uh, and he is a bit unpredictable. Like he's just as prone to like go off and, and um, on Jesse as he is. But he's had a strange relationship with Jesse. Has he has looked on him as the surrogate son? 
Uh, and I think Jesse's unaware of that. And as we see in season, f- in the second half of season five, uh, Walt continually refuses to kill Jesse, even when a lot of other people around him say that's exactly what he needs to do. So he does have a soft spot for Jesse. Uh, of course, that does end <laughs> towards the end of season five after Jesse completely screws Walt over, and that's when J- Walt has had enough of him. But even then, like, and this is something I'll cover in part two, of course, that uh, Walt's dying. Uh, the last thing he do does before he dies, his dying action is to save Jesse's life. Uh, so it does show that Jesse, that Walt has always cared more about Jesse than Jesse realizes. And it's an interesting, and also he's hurt Jesse more than he realizes. So it's an interesting dynamic. We have the whole scene where Walt and had the montage, and this is where we do to get a time jump of Walt being successful and cooking and everything goes smoothly, which is why they kind of glide all over <laughs> this time frame and just sort of move past it because... You know, the storytelling is when you get into the conflict, the interesting things, but the, everything here is going smoothly. So they just um, cover it over a huge montage, which covers a large portion of time until uh, Skylar finally goes up to... Um, well, first we get a scene with Marie where we're saying, isn't it time for the kids to come home to you? Because I, I don't know, I can't remember how long it's been for this point. Not quite a year, like, but several months. And uh, she's like, isn't it time for the kids to go back home? And so Skylar reveals to Walt and takes him out to a place where she has all the money hidden. And apparently it's a huge old giant pile of money that she doesn't even know how much. It's just like so much, so much money she doesn't even know what to do with. Uh, she can't even count it. She can't even figure out how much it is. And uh, she's saying that they could never launder this money uh, and that this money they could last 10 lifetimes and they couldn't launder it with like 100 car washes. And she's like, how much bigger does this pile need to be before it's enough? And he finally brings, she finally says, she finally brings Walt back to Earth. So he finally decides, okay, I'm out. And so we get another time jump and I think another several months have passed after they've, after he's retired and the kids have returned home and they're having happy lives so it's a happy ending for Walt everything's going so great so we can end the show now nope can't end the show because of that first scene we got at the beginning of the season we need to get there and they're casually having dinner with Hank and he just needs to use the can and goes to sit down and find some reading material as he's taking a dump and uh, just so happens to come across the book that um, Gail had given to Walt that has something an entry at the start where Gail says to WW, which of course he had seen Gail, um, Hank had seen this previously when he was in, in a different book when he was investigating uh, Hank's death, I mean Gail's death, sorry. And uh, he didn't know who WW was, but of course this book makes it very clear to my other WW. Uh, and uh, Walt has the book and has the flashback where he's saying, who could be WW? Uh, Walter White? And he's like, you got me. Like, And then Hank has that look of, holy fuck. What a great way. This is the ending. This is like the, the mid-season finale. And what a great way to end the mid-season. Like, holy fuck. That was an amazing uh, cliffhanger. Absolutely amazing. Um... And it does set up for this for the second half really nicely. And that was just an amazing episode. Absolutely love that episode. So that is it for my part one of Breaking Bad Season 5. I shall be back next month to cover the second half and El Camino of uh, Season 5 of Breaking Bad. Uh, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. Also check out my channel as I cover many other shows such as Star Trek The Expanse, The Outer Limits, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.